For over 50 years, the British Touring Car Championship has been one of the world's most popular motorsport series. This is the story of the legendary drivers, the legendary cars, and the legendary moments that have made it such a success. The man's an animal. This is Touring Car Legends. the fingers on the left, then it's go! 1995 was to prove a pivotal year in the history of British touring cars and will be the last hurrah for one of the championship's great double acts. And here is Cleland almost home after a stunning day of success. First in race one from pole position with a record lap. Pole position race two, fastest lap race two, and he wins! The car was just amazing. At the start of the year, we tested it, and I said, we're going to win this championship. It's easy. Put it back in the truck and bring it to the first race. It's fabulous. Um, that's how confident I was. After six wins, Cleland would take the title at Alton Park. John Cleland finishes second to win the championship, and is he happy? At Alton Park, he stuck a microphone under my nose to sort of, well done, you won the championship, what do you want to say? and I couldn't say anything. I was choked up. I'd, I'd worked all year for it. <laughs> Delighted, it's just... <laughs> I don't know what to say now. <laughs> it's been a long year coming, and uh, it's just great. <laughs> really good. And so, to the victor, the spoils. So that was probably the real high point, but there have been so many high points in, in, in the BTCC. Lots of things, lots of real characters, lots of professional drivers, and I think probably the, the best thing is that I, I was offered a drive with virtually every manufacturer at some stage in my career, except for Honda, and I decided to, to stick with them all the way, stick with Vauxhall. I don't regret that at all. I think Vauxhall got their money's worth out of me, but they... They also had to have a full-time lawyer because I wasn't shy at saying what I thought and that sometimes got everybody into trouble. And, but I always think before I open my mouth, it may not always appear that way, but I've always prided myself in saying the right thing that will get the right degree of publicity or you better go and talk to him, you know? The man's an animal. How good is that? Everybody uses that now. <laughs> in Formula One, Nigel Mansell was my man because Wherever Nigel was, there was something dramatic going on. And to a slightly lesser extent, it was the same with John Cleland, because you'd got, A, the Scottishness of it, B, the impish humour of it, C, the fact that he was in a Vauxhall and not in a car that you would have expected automatically to win. Uh, but most of all, his personality and character. He was always, he was always cheerful, always tremendously sharp, always great fun, and, and, and lovely to be with. British Touring Car Championship, in order to get the publicity, so did many others, particularly Renault. And Renault really went full house because they didn't just take a Laguna and make one or two changes to it, they went to Williams Formula One racing and said, make us a Laguna. When the Williams Formula One team turned up with Renault and a 60-man team to run a touring car, um, you know, that, that did seem a bit extreme. Williams Renault arrived a year after another team with F1 Connections, Tom Walkinshaw Racing. TWR had won the BTCC with Wynne Percy as long ago as 1980 and had returned in 94 with the Bonkers 850 estate. You think of Volvo and the BTCC, you think of the 850 estate. And bizarrely, it was only for one, one year of, of, of their, what, uh, eight years of competition or something. So um, it just goes to show how, how powerful that was. The estate used the same mechanicals as the saloon, and they knew they weren't going to be that competitive in the first year. They needed to get a year under their belt of running the car and the team and the drivers. So that's why they used the estate. And it was just heaven for the BTCC as well as Volvo. John Cleland might have raced for Vauxhall, but his day job was running a Volvo dealership. 
it was the car that we as Volvo dealers sold lots and lots of. It changed the image of the car immediately. In the days when Volvo were involved in that championship, we saw people come through the door saying, is that the car that they were racing at the weekend? And yes, it was. And, and it just completely changed that perceived image of the Volvo brand. Vauxhall would replace the Cavalier with the new Vectra for the 96 season. And although Cleland would win two races in 98, he would never again challenge for the championship. He finally retired in 1999 with happy memories. For me, it was fabulous. I was doing something. I was being paid to do something I would have done for free. I never told the people at Vauxhall I would have done it for free, but I was being paid to do, to have fun. It was just a ball. Uh, it was something that I dreamt about, something I, I always wanted to do, but it then evolved into a massive show. And I was part of it. I was one of the leading lights in that show. And uh, it was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. I'm getting paid to do it. How good is that? And now it's time for Go in 1996. The green light and Frank Beeler leads. If further proof was needed that the BTCC was hitting the big time, it came with the arrival of a works Audi team at the beginning of 96. The four-wheel front of the Audi out of the corner is terrific and we're with Frank Beeler now. The blue flag waves, but Beeler doesn't need to worry. He crosses the line to win the third race in succession in the Audi A4 Quattro. Audi came over. Audi must have been watching the British Touring Car Championship and someone must have said, I think we'd better have a bit of that. So they sent Frank Beeler over and he had a British uh, partner, John Bincliffe, who drove the other, four-wheel drive Audis, uh, and they made mincemeat out of everybody else. The man of this year's British Touring Car Championship is Frank Beeler. Eight wins, and he says he looks forward to returning next year to defend his title. That is very good news. Now all of a sudden you had half the field full of international guys that you couldn't even pronounce their names. So that did bring a whole different level to it. The easiest way for me to gauge it was a paddock. Um, and you, you, you went through from transporters with an awning to these massive structures that they'd bring in. And you look at some of the, uh, some of the hospitality and uh, infrastructure they'd bring into the, into the race meeting, you think, this is nuts, you know. A few years ago, the cost of doing that would be for the whole championship, but now someone's sandwich bill for the year would probably run a privateer. For the old hands of the BTCC, it was a bit of a culture shock. There were so many good drivers in the Touring Car Championship. When it was super touring, they came from all over Europe. You know, there was, there was um, you know, teams from Italy and Germany. And, um, you know, it was an international championship run on, on British circuits. We went with the flow and we may enjoyed it while it lasted, but you've got to remember in the mid-90s there were nine factory teams. That's nine works, fully paid up manufacturer teams, all spending millions of pounds with two professional drivers, international drivers from around the world. So there were 18 fully paid up factory drivers and I shouldn't think one of them was on less than 100, 150 grand. So it was the ultimate professional racing series, more professional drivers than even in Formula One to this day. I was actually on a contract with TWR when I drove the Volvos. I had to weigh 80 kilos um, in my driving kit. I mean, it was a time when you had to take it seriously. I mean, the, the amount of pressure and money was indescribable. So it was an absolutely incredible period of excess. It was just getting silly. It was getting out of hand. But you know, we're in it. We're being paid to be in it. You think, well, let's not rock the boat here, guys. This is good fun. Let's keep at it. Keep our head down, you know. Let them spend the money. In 1997, there was even a hit computer game, Toka Touring Cars, introducing the BTCC to the PlayStation generation. We'd never have thought that the name Toka would be on a, on a computer game. <laughs> you know, that was something new. The amount of kids that have come up to me and said, I took you off in Toka 2 or whatever it was last night. And the truth of it is, I think I have only been on that Toka game once in my life, and my kids beat me senseless on it, so I've never been back anywhere near it again. He hadn't made it into the game yet, but a new... Full of hell. And um, I thought, I'm not having this, I'm going to go and see Frank. And that was the day that changed my life.
With so many international superstars vying for a place on the BTCC grid, just getting noticed called for desperate measures. Jason Plato had just completed a successful test with the Williams Renault team when a letter from Sir Frank Williams arrived. Saying, look, you did a great job in the test. There's nothing you could have done to get the drive. It's, it's out of your reach and the reasons are we need someone with profile, we can have a you know, Formula 1 driver and it was either going to be Jean-Christophe Bouboulion or Gian, Gianni Morbidelli. And that was a big kick in the teeth actually because I thought, oh God, you know, what do I need to do? The one thing you have to have is you know, this insane belief in your own ability you know? and, and, and I have that and I think all drivers do. So the actual, the actual doing the bit in the car um, was never a doubt in my mind. This is a big upward step for me and I'll give it absolutely everything. Whereas, you know, these failed F1 drivers, is it really a career step for them? Are they just, you know, they're on the way down. You know, give, give me a break, give me a chance. A few weeks after that letter from Frank and the phone call from Re Re Renault, I woke up full of hell and um, I thought, I'm not having this, I'm going to go and see Frank. And that was the day that changed my life. His radical plan was to confront Sir Frank in person at the Williams HQ. He got past security, but the boss's PA was a different matter. You can't walk off the street and come and see the most important man in motorsport. You'll have to go. I argued a bit. Anyway, I didn't win the argument. But just before I left, she let out a nugget of information, which I said, well, look, can, can you pass on my, you know, my, my regards, but also let Frank know that I... I have been to sit see him and maybe I can reschedule, you know, schedule an appointment. And he said, look, it's, you're wasting your time. He's not here till lunchtime anyway. Ah. So next plan was come out. I think I, I moved my car here. It was definitely there. And I chose this because I can see security. And in the old days, that, that hedgerow wasn't there. So I could wait, wait for his car coming in. And also I'm kind of hidden from the factory unit. So I basically sat here smoking myself to oblivion, eating mint, speaking to my dad, am I doing the right thing? for the best part of three and a bit hours. And then Frank, Frank's car came in, off I went after him. I charged over here with my briefcase, which was empty, and Frank's car just turned right, just by the, where those flat flags are. And from this perspective, I thought he's gonna go through that, that back, that gate over there, and he's gone. So I was in full, full Lin Linford Christie mode, running across the grass, only, <laughs> Only for him to do a, a right turn and park exactly where that car is. But by now, I've arrived at the car in a full-blown sprint, and I, I'm now staring at the car from, say, this distance, trying to break into a, a cool walk. It was awkward, to say the least. And that's, well, we'll go over there. This, this is where it all, this is, you know, was my defining moment in my career, was here. This is where I ended up, over here, Staring, I mean, I was, at, I was at the car door like this, staring at Frank, thinking, oh my God, what, what am I doing? Forgot that, you know, he needs to be taken out of the car now. I've got this horrible gut-wrenching awkwardness here, thinking, what the hell am I doing? You know, and begged and pleaded with, with, with him just there for him to give me five minutes of his time. And he, he agreed after a bit of negotiation, and, and in we went. Probably one of my most proudest moments in my life, actually, that, you know, had I not, had I not done what I did that day, we wouldn't be speaking now. You know, I wouldn't have had a touring car career. So, yeah, it was all, all down to that tree, that grass, and that little car park space, and a bit of hard talking. Yeah. Sir Frank's offer was a shootout against Bouillon and Morbidelli. Jason came out on top and this launched him on a career that would see him win more races than anyone else in B. Amazing. This, all, this is a, a championship killer. You know, so now I'm in this most amazing place. I, you know, I'm in the best team, I've got the best car. OK, I've got the world's best touring car driver as my teammate, but what? He's the finest driver in the world in touring cars. And his performances were just epic. And, uh, you know, I know how hard <coughs> I was pushing and I know how detailed our analysis was and, uh, you know, how finite we went into our performance. And it was just quicker. And it was just something... It was just 
a little bit everywhere. Engine revs build as we prepare for the start. Rydell on the left as we look at it. Reed on the right and James Thompson getting away well in third. The 1998 championship would see Sweden's Richard Rydell win his and Volvo's only title in an S40. A year later, Laurent Aiello would win the championship at his first attempt in a Nissan Primera. But the year was better remembered for the performance of a young Brit in a privateer Nissan. McNeil gets away from pole position. James Thompson goes with him. Not a brilliant getaway from Thompson, but I think he's picked it up into second place. It's Alain Menu, then in third place. But Matt Neal out in front in his privateer car ahead of the manufacturer entries. Matt Neal had made his debut back in 1991, but in 99 he got his big break. Series promoter Alan Gow had put up a prize of £250,000 for the first privateer driver to win a race. That was a prize we put up uh, for the year for the first independent to win a, a race outright. And because it had never been done for the last I don't know, seven or eight years, um, we we're fairly confident that it'll take some time. At the first round at Donington Park, Neil qualified second, but almost blew his chance in the compulsory pit stop. The clock is ticking away. They're going for the two side tyres to change. They've done it. He's dropped him down. Oh, he stalled it! I don't believe it, but he's going again. When it stalled, I thought it was all over because the, the Nissan then was incredibly hard to start it, uh, when, when the engine was hot. So it wouldn't, you'd all be there cranking it over, cranking it over. So it stalled and I, you just immediately go for the button and it flicks straight away. Pure luck. It's a brilliant recovery, but he's lost crucial time there. Where's he going to bring him out? Well, look at them. There come the leaders. One, two, three, four, fifth. He comes back out in fifth place. Then I saw them streaming past the end of the pits and I thought, oh, I'm blowing this now. But I knew I'd pitted later, so my tyres were fresher. Um, and I just thought, well, get your head down and see where we can get up to, see if we can get on the podium. Matt's dad, Steve, raced touring cars in the 1960s, but was now back as team principal. The one way we could always make Matt go faster was to make him angry. And it's strange, his anger, there was the one emotion that gave, fed him with the adrenaline necessary to go faster. And I think he was so angry with himself, instead of collapsing in a big heap, it inspired him and he just drove the neck off that car. It was a great car. Down to the old hairpin, sneaking, sneaking, he's there, he's alongside. And James Thompson, I thought he had protected his position, but Matt Neal just took it away anyway, and he has got in front once again. And just look at the reaction down there in the garage, and Matt Neal is heading for victory. He's heading for the first ever independence win. He's heading for 250 grand. What a performance this has been by Matt Neal and the family run team. They have done it. They've beaten all the manufacturer teams here and they had to fight for it as well. Leading in the early stages, losing it on the pit stops, but coming back for victory. You'll see Matt Neal's name written very hurriedly with a marker pen because all of a sudden we weren't prepared for it. Um, and I had to quickly write his name on it just before I went up there. So it was a shame that it, 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 it got paid out at, at the very first race meeting, um, but to a very deserving uh, team. You know, um, uh, Matt and Steve and Team Dynamics are great stalwarts of, of the championship. It couldn't have gone to a better team. The win would set Neil on his way to success in the noughties. It was almost an out-of-body experience winning the first race because we, I mean, I'd almost been in touring cars for a decade. It, it, it seemed like a decade. It was probably about six, seven, eight years. But, but it was quite surreal because I thought winning my first race, the big thing, everything, check, everything, it's going to change your life. And actually, it changes nothing. You know, you still get up the next morning, you're the same person. It's then you pick yourself up and you go, right, the next target's this, and you, and you move on. And, and that, it, it changes you as a person, I think, a little bit. It changed me. Matt Neal's £250,000 win was a high point in a championship that was becoming the battle of the budgets. We didn't have the control over the technical regulations that we had earlier, and things started getting out of control, if you like, with aerodynamics and, and homologation specials and everything else. That drove up the cost um, uh, considerably. We did have some interesting homologation issues, and there were lots of debates as to uh, how we could build X number of cars with a certain special wing on it just to get the dynamic aerodynamics right of a car. But that's part of the game and that's part of, I suppose, part of the 
fun of it that we enjoy, but it's not necessarily in the best interest of the sport. The worst part about that is, is it drove up the cost and actually reduced the racing because you had cars then that were so aerodynamically efficient, they couldn't follow cars in front too closely and it just took away from the racing a fair bit. Ten and a half million was, was the top budget for the, the, that I knew about and I'm sure there's more on top of that. That's just the racing budget, not including the marketing, the hospitality and everything else. Ten and a half million was one I knew about and the top driver got um, 800,000 pounds but I don't think you probably would admit it to nowadays. The Ford Mondeo produced by Richards ProDrive that took Alan Menu to the 2000 Championship was probably the most expensive touring car ever built. The Mondeo behind me is a very sophisticated piece of equipment with a, uh, a V6 engine that's built like a Swiss watch and uh, all the rest of the tricks on it and we ran two cars at the front of the field and. Um, I guess at that time we probably employed sort of 80 people running that small program. Deep down, those involved knew it couldn't last. Even before the 2000 season had begun, Renault, Nissan and Volvo pulled out. It was just impossible to last, but I, I think for me it was that budgetary thing. When the budgets became um, uh, unjustifiable unless you won, and only one out of the nine manufacturers was going to win, we were always going to lose manufacturers. So for me, that was, that was the problem. The year 2000 was the last hurrah for the super touring cars. New regulations were brought in for 2001, which slashed costs by 40%. But of the big manufacturers, only Vauxhall remained. The Vauxhall was just light years ahead of everything else, light years. We had such an advantage in our car, we weren't running at full throttle because it would have just looked stupid. And then it became an interesting dynamic because then it was me against Muller. Not the harmonious of times, it has to be said. And another great lesson in the dynamics of inter-team rivalries and politics. The seed for this rivalry had been sown at Thruxton a year earlier when Plato was forced to concede the race lead to Muller, whose contract dictated that he was the number one driver. In my mind, what number one status meant was that towards the end of the year, if a van was ahead, then of course I would support him. And if that meant I'd let him through towards the end of the year, not race two, especially when I'm ahead of him in the series, it just didn't make sense to me. So I ignored the radio calls until the last lap and then did the big slow down indicator on, waved him through. You can complain about team orders, you can complain that Muller perhaps was gifted this win, but you cannot criticise Vauxhall for the performance of these cars. Vauxhall absolutely dominant this afternoon. Muller and Plato won two. From that moment on, knowing oh, I've just got to kiss I Ivan's bum all year, and uh, that's a, not a very nice thing to have to do. And I did, you know, I did what was required, and I conceded victories and conceded positions. And uh, but, but you know, you, you come home, you, you, the check arrives in the post, you bank it, and you go, okay. It's so just one of those things you have to do as a professional driver. For year two, though, Plato managed to secure equal number one status. Battle was joined. The Plato-Muller battle of 2001, for right and wrong reasons, will be remembered a long time. They all kicked off at Donington, I remember. Avan made a bit of a hairy move on me, barging to me. I thought, not having that, so I barged it back, and actually he got pretty... He went a bit over the top. On board with Plato, that's Avan Muller ahead of us. The whole protagonist, a little bit of a headbutt there from Jason Plato, and he's muscled through. Has he left more contact? Muller says, you've got to be kidding, Sunshine. You're not getting through that easily. Yeah, I think he can actually spell the back of Jason Plato's Vauxhall from here. Ivan Muller burying his nose in the boost. Yeah, then we get to Silverstone, where it really went <laughs> into orbit. On the last lap, Plato was chasing Muller when the Frenchman hit trouble. Plato now putting Muller under real pressure. Yeah, a bit of a wobble there for Muller after bridge, left-hander. This is his opportunity. Contact, though. Plato's through. Contact with Muller and Plato. For some reason, I'd clattered into his front left wheel. And there was no need, because I was, I was there, I was inside. We should just accelerate away. Ivan didn't retire, but his front suspension, was, his track rod had gone. Well, Jason Plato is rounding and taking the chequered flag. Well done, guys. Great race. I won the race. Ivan took the chequered flag and parked 
on the circuit and got out, started shaking his head. And so I still, at that point, did, didn't know what had happened. In my mind, I was completely innocent. I, di I didn't drive into it. Something had gone wrong. The team split itself in half. The information wasn't relayed. It was kept secret that a van had run out of fuel and uh, I got done by the officials and kicked out. I was looking after my tyre the three last lap and unfortunately I had a, a small uh, engine cut uh, in bridge and when the engine came back, phew, I had a big shunt. So that's it. Uh, anyone can, uh, can watch TV and judge himself. I was the villain for that in everybody's eyes and I simply wasn't. I was a completely innocent party. And Avan's performance on the podium where he did the big refuse to shake my hand was just now, when we know what happened, it's appalling. And that's why the relationship between me and Avan broke down. Muller was both a brilliant driver and a brilliant politician. The team split in two and the arguments continued until the final round at Brands Hatch. The track is absolutely saturated as the championship decider gets underway. Plato trying to go up to the outside of Ivan Muller. Warren Hughes leading. Plato squeezing with Muller and getting past both of them. Phil Bennett gets through on the inside and he's up into second, although Muller's going on the attack once again. Jason Plato needs to follow Ivan Muller and keep him in sight. Very much so to win this title. Oh, what a rivalry there has been between the two of them. But Phil Bennett just ahead of those two. These track conditions not any better. Warren Hughes sliding around. Who's that? That's Plato! That's Plato! He's lost it! At Surtees round it goes! Wheel spin, he's trying to get himself dug out of the grass. Would you believe it? Is this the end of the championship for Jason Plato? Well, he's found reverse pretty quickly. He has not quite hit the barrier, I don't think. He may just have touched it. He rejoins, but as it stands right now, he's just thrown away the 2001 title. Ivan Muller in control of this race at the moment, but uh, you just have to wonder. Oh, and he's lost it again through Surtees. Well, not too badly. He saved it and went across the grass. Didn't do the spin we saw from Plato earlier. That's the second time Muller's done that, though. And Ivan Muller will just wait for the safety car to come back in to try and maintain the lead. Actually, there was something underneath his car there. Just have a look underneath Ivan Muller's car. There are flames. Oh, crazy. He's pulling over, he's pulling right over to the side of the track, he's pulling off. No, the fire is still there. Oh, and this spells the end surely of his championship now. He had to finish ahead of Plato. Bennett's going to take his first win of the season, but for Jason Plato, there's a much bigger prize on offer, and that is the 2001 title, and his dad's up there to celebrate already. Jason Plato wins the championship. What a day. Plato was the champion, but he was out of a drive. Won it in 2001. Couldn't drive for the team because Van had another year on his contract, and there was no way it was going to work. And, of course, you know, back in those days, there was only one major manufacturer to drive for. Where were you going to get paid? So I went off and tried to do some NASCAR. But to come in as a newcomer to that style of racing at this stage of my career and my age, <clears throat> was a bit scary, to be honest. The 2001 season would also mark the retirement of one of the BTCC's great stalwarts. At 49, Steve Soper was persuaded to return to the championship with Peugeot. But a huge accident at the final round at Brands Hatch ended his professional career. Oh, that's a huge off! That's Steve Soper, that is a massive accident. Looking back, I probably wished I had never done it because the car, we couldn't get competitive. I never won a race. So we finished the season with an accident without winning a race and it sort of... Uh, it, it, I had a fairly serious neck injury and it, that stopped any jollies from there on after. I felt fine at the time. As time went on, it became quite painful. Basically, when I went to a consultant and they referred me to more consultants, they all said, stop, stop uh, motor racing. So that was a bit of a blow. I think I had a privileged life. 30 years I raced for, 21 years, I think, professionally being paid. So what a fantastic, privileged life. As one legend's career was ending, others were only just beginning and the returning Plato would enter into a rivalry more intense than any other in touring car history. I'm going to rip your face off. You know what that? I'm going to rip your face off. Hey, 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 back in there. Manufacturers may have come and gone, but one name continued to top the touring car timesheets in the noughties, Vauxhall.
Yorkshireman James Thompson, who had first graced the championship in 1994, claimed the 2002 and 2004 championships in an Astra. Winning it the first time was, you know, unbelievable, but, you know, the fight that we've had all year, you know, and take it down to the last, the last race of the year, um, and, uh, you know, to do it on the fastest lap, you know, I knew. And at one point in it? I, well, that's why I worked so hard in the early part of the race, and then, to be honest with you, I just let him get on with it, you know, I just sat there, the car was fantastic. His teammate at the time, Ivan Muller, won his only title in 2003 while Fabrizio Giovanardi became the second Italian winner with back-to-back -back titles behind the wheel of a Vectra in 2007 and 2008. The Italian flag for Fabrizio Giovanardi. But the highlight for many during this period was the fierce rivalry between Jason Plato, who returned to the BTCC in 2004 with Seat, and Matt Neal, champion in 2005, 6 and 11. The three times British Touring Car champion, the champion of 2011, it is Matt Neal. He's done it. Matt Neal wins the title. It began at Knock Hill in 2005. Oh, that's, I knew that was going to happen. I couldn't believe it. What's going to happen here? Matt Neal's off, surely. Oh, they're fighting with their towel sideways with Plato, and it's Plato who's off now. Matt Neal's got back through. Matt Neal's got back through all that amazing, amazing action going on. And the intensity of their rivalry would outstrip even the Clennon Sofa battle of yesteryear. When Ivan started playing games and Jason ran me from behind, I'll tell you what, that was just disgraceful. He's at... He's an absolute pig, Plato, and I'll tell you what, I hope Seattle are proud of their lead driver, the way he's driving. That was awful. I was lucky to get out of it. He's got his way of doing things and his views on me and I've got the same, so... Yeah, he's got his supporters, I've got mine, but uh, his supporters aren't very <laughs> keen on me, but, um, yeah, we, we've, we've got our own way of doing things. 5% is pantomime, 95% is pure... Pure animosity. <laughs> I'll be complete, frank and honest, you know, me and Matt, we don't get on. Me and his dad don't get on. Me and Team Dynamics, we don't get on. Never have done. I don't trust him and I don't trust his dad and I don't trust the team and I'm pretty sure he feels exactly the same way about me. Things got ugly at Snetterton in 2006. Can Matt get a better exit? He's on the outside, he's on the outside. This could be contact at the bottom hole. It's not a good place to have contact. Oh, Matt Neal sideways, championship leader in big trouble. Sideways, he gets it back again. It's Plato and Matt Neal side by side, but looking it's not into over each other. Yet. It's not over yet. Matt won't like that. His car's quick round here. Now he's on the back. This time, Jason Plato across the grass. Matt Neal's facing the wrong way. Can he get it started? Jason Plato's going to win the race. Matt Neal went for it, but he's lost his chance of getting points. And Jason Plato takes the win. That Snetterton incident is where it all... <sighs> yeah, that was quite that was quite a kick off of that. I think we were both a bit naughty. I should have got out the throttle. But of course, you're doing what, 110 mile an hour? And You've only got two, two metres to make that decision before it then goes into something else. And I didn't make that decision. I was still in, I'm going to, the corner's mine, the corner's mine. And, of course, it then gets to the point where he's now on the front of my car. Ugh, what can you do? And, of course, tempers were, were frayed then. And, you know, and you could see, partly one of my frustrations, it's just the car advantage he had round Corum. I mean, just like... You know, I'm like that, and he's cruising round. And, of course, he got down the inside, and, you know, there was a professional foul committed, most certainly. Hands up. 2010 saw Plato edging out Neil to claim his second championship, this time in a Chevrolet. Well, the 2011 season started with history being made. Jason Plato is going to become a record-breaking winner in British touring cars. He has now beaten Andy Rouse's record. He's got 61 wins in the British Touring Car Championship, and that is a huge achievement in British touring cars. This was also the year that saw his rivalry with Matt Neal reach new heights during qualifying at Rockingham. There was a lot from behind the camera which people didn't know about or aware, were aware of that had been going on between me and him and um, we'd had a bit of a run in, in qualifying as well, not even the race. And it's just sort of sparked things off a little bit more. 
Oh, Matt Neal actually hit the back of Plato there, Tim. What is going on? Hitting him on a on a sort of qualifying run, and he ran into the rear bumper of Plato. Track position is crucial. It's important. You know, the last thing you want to do is get stuffed behind one of the, one of the Hondas, and because you have to leave the pit lane in garage order, you know what could have happened was. And this is my, gen my gen general distrust of the Honda operation, and it is at all costs fight Pl Plato. And we know that because we scan their radios. My worry there was I was going to get stuck behind one of the Hondas and they were going to effectively hamper my session. In the pit lane, it all kicked off. I'm going to rip your face off. You know what that? I'm going to rip your face off. Hey, 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 hey. Oh, yeah. it in, For God's sake, hey, hey. tell him to stop it. Be careful, Jason. Be careful. Be careful, son. Not one of, one of my proudest moments, but it, it would probably got to be done. He wouldn't take his helmet off, though, would he? Matt's um, second Dan black belt in what they call street fighting. He's very, very competent, very, very strong, very, very fit, and uh, it's the last bloke anybody would want to pick a fight with, quite honestly. <laughs> it would have been a bit one-sided, I feel. The last thing you do is you go and pick a fight with a driver who's got a helmet on, surely. You know, and, hey, I, I'm, a, I'm a lover, not a fight fighter. You know, I, I'm not a fighty bloke. I'm a runner, definitely. I can run away from stuff. At least Jason's father, Tim, provided some light relief. See, the funny thing with this, I'm playing it back, it's just my old man with his posh voice. <laughs> for, good, for God's sake, Barry, tell him to stop it. Pack it in, man. It's my old man, he just comes out with some gems. You know, after... After this, yeah, after all that calmed down a week or so afterwards, you know, that, that, that footage was doing the round on YouTube. And the, the one thing which made us chuckle over and over and over again is just my old man with his, <laughs> with his daft voice. That the two biggest legends of the 21st century have been such bitter rivals has certainly raised the temperature of the modern BTCC. I think it motivates them both. I think that Jason's just as, <laughs> just as motivated by his, his frustration and anger, and he's, he gets very frustrated. Jason's got a very high opinion of himself, hasn't he? And uh, maybe he deserves to. It's, he's, he's done extremely well. Yeah, profile is important. And I took the decision that it's actually... There's more success to be made by being the villain than there is by being the good guy. And there's more column inches to be gained by being the villain. So I've played up to that a bit. And, uh, yeah, so I've only got kind of, I guess, got myself to blame for that, that reputation. But, you know, it served me pretty well. I'm sure at some point in the future, we will sit down and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll vent our spleens and we'll get a beer and we'll have a laugh and a, a dance about it and share a few humorous stories, I guess. I guess that tends to happen when you get old and mellow. Whether it'll happen before I stop racing, I very much doubt it. In recent times, Plato and Neil are not the only drivers to take each other out. There was also a famous moment when Neil hit teammate Gordon Shen. Here comes Matt Neil for the lead, for the lead! Jason Plato is going to be handed victory as the two Hondas do a Red Bull and take each other off. Second place goes to Collard. Look, he is holding his head. He knows he's done an absolutely terrible mistake there and he should have just taken the second place. He can't believe it. I thought there was enough grip on the inside and there obviously wasn't, but um, I had to go back. Obviously, I had to talk to the team, then talk to Flash, and then I had to go and we got 200 Honda guests there, including the MD, the PR director, the marketing director. So I had to go and stand up in front of all those, which wasn't one of the proudest moments. It was, it was, it was difficult. Had that happened to me four or five years earlier, I think I'd have been jumping up and down off the roof, going, you know, going berserk. But I had enough time to, to try and gather my thoughts a little bit. And it was my attitude that probably kind of you know, gelled us together a little bit closer as a team, you know, from that point forward. It could have gone one of two ways. We could have split the team in half and split the garage in half from that moment forward. But that was, that was actually never a thought. It was never a consideration. If anything, it brought us closer together. And, you know, we've moved forward from that and we've had, you know, you know so much more success since, uh, 
you know, since that cold, wet day at Oaton Park. Champion in 2012, Shedden is one of the new breed of British touring car racers taking the fight to the old guard. For me, it was always about touring cars. It was never about Formula One or, you know, or single seaters or anything like that. And I was just a kid on the spectator banks with my dad, you know, watching, you know, went to Knock Hill to watch in, in 1994, uh, you know, in the height of super touring. I, I've still got the posters, you know, signed by, you know, Tarquini, Steve Soper, and, uh, you know, the guys in the BMW at the time. And, so I've watched them race as a small boy, I mean, Tim Harvey and even Matt Neal was racing back then and, uh, and that was me still in shorts at primary school. The dream was about touring cars, never ever thought I'd make it into, you know, to drive in one, let alone win a race and, uh, you know, you ultimately win a championship. At the final round of the 2013 season at Brands Hatch, Neil, Plato, Shedden and 2009 champion Colin Turkington were all vying for the championship alongside 24-year-old Andrew Jordan. Lights out, away they go! With new rules encouraging bigger grids and a host of young stars, the next generation of touring car legends is taking shape. The racing in these cars is very, very close and, again, that's what makes touring cars so good to watch. You know, at Alton Park this year, we were getting 45,000 people there. Huge viewing figures on TV and, uh, you know, regardless of what the cars are, how quick they go, it makes for exciting racing. One of the original legends still takes a keen interest. Jack Sears was back at Brands Hatch, where he won the first championship in 1958. It's been raining just as hard today as it did 55 years ago. Aquaplaning cars, uh, we didn't have such good tyres as they have today, of course. We didn't have wet weather tyres, really. I mean, we just had to have road tyres. Who did the trick? He's now won 81 British Touring Car Championship races. When I saw him recently, I congratulated him on his 80th win, and he looked at me and he said, I want you around when I've done 100. And I bet he will do 100 too. He's well on the way. If we couldn't have done it, I couldn't have think, thought of a better person, better team of people to do it. So, absolutely fantastic. We'll be back. More than half a century on from the first titanic duel between Sopwith and Sears, the British Touring Car Championship remains Britain's best-loved motorsport series. The old recipe still works. Great cars, great characters, great racing, and an irresistible spirit. At 10, Cullen continues his quest for revenge as the suit plot to disrupt the progress of the railroad in Hell on Wheels. First, Jeremy wades on the trail of a fish with a very scary reputation. River Monsters is next.